Carl and Liam here from Games, Brains and Headbanging Live, GBH Bill at Tom for sure, and it is We're Afraid of the Dark, our episodic recap of Are You Afraid of the Dark? We're up to season two, episode two, The Tale of the Midnight Madness, the 15th episode overall, written by Chloe Brown and directed by DJ McHale. Now, focusing on season two specifically, this same writer and same director did the previous episode, the debut premiere of season two one of the worst episodes i've ever seen this same writer and director have now followed that up with what i think is arguably at least in my opinion at this point the best episode i've seen to date a truly spectacular uh, episode that delivers on all fronts that i watched it was so good that i watched it did partial notes stopped halfway through just to watch it fully without being distracted and then we watched it a second time to finish up that is the first time that's happened. I was that impressed by what I was witnessing. It blows my mind, the disparity between the two episodes. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. And one thing I'll just put right out there is a lot of the criticisms we put from the ep- last episode, this literally takes all of those things we didn't like and reverses them and does them exactly how you should. One of the primary things being that we mentioned how that episode was lacking in the horror and scares department and how they can push to a certain line with these episodes in these teen or kid shows of with the horror and they can push it quite close. We've seen that before. And I think this is a, just a perfect example of doing that, of really taking it just the close to the line, but not going beyond it, you know? Well said. It was also a nostalgic hit for me. As uh, once it got going, it was like, oh shit, I've seen this before. It was kind of cool. It, yeah, I do think it is, you know, uh, generally rated as one of the higher uh, episodes of the uh, entire show. So it's, it's it's commonly, but you know, that's a common opinion, basically. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right, a cast for the actual episode. Eddie Robinson as Pete, Melanie Westenthal as Katie, Harry Stanjavosky as Mr. Kristoff, Aaron Tagger as Dr. Vink. Yes, you heard that right. It is a Dr. Vink episode. And to give you an indication of where this episode is going, Chris Heyerdahl as Nosferatu. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Frank's second story, only his second story and first for season two. And if you're wondering what Frank's previous episode was, just to remind you, his was the first ever episode, The Tale of the Phantom Cab. Man, let Frank tell stories more often. <laughs> Frank's hitting it, man. That's not bad, isn't it? Um, I mean, that's quite a high bar. So, you know, doesn't want to like do too many and like <laughs> lower his grade, you know? <laughs> Uh, okay so this is the last episode to show a scene where the midnight society s- discussed the story part way through the telling and i was so glad to read it i was like oh we've always criticized that yeah that is that is a welcome thing to leave in the past i, I thought this was interesting from this point on this episode on aaron tagger would wear a fake beard as dr vink as he had shaved it off for his appearance in the tale of laughing in the dark so going hmm. forward, it would be a fake beard. I did wonder why it looked a little bit a little bit different, but there you go. That's the reason. <laughs> and finally, the last bit of trivia. DJ McHale has stated that this is his favourite episode. I think it's a lot of people's favourite episode. Definitely up there. Going to be a hard one to top, I think, once we come to the, the uh, tier lists. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but they've now begun doing the full intro for the show, whereas before it was sort of like a, a cut version, I guess, but now they've They've made a full, the full, like classic intro for the show. The one we all immediately remember. Yes. I wonder why they came to that decision to decide to, oh, we're making season two, let's film like a longer version for the intro. Cause it's obviously a bit longer and stuff like that to get to the actual show. I'm going to say that the intro was always filmed. It was always filmed. And initially the time stop probably meant that they had to cut it down and maybe they got an extra 30 seconds, extra minute given to them or extra type different, you know what I mean? Like as the show was getting more popular into its second season. Because I did notice with these episodes, just uh, I think in the first season, they were like 22-ish <laughs> minutes long, but now they're going up to like 25 minutes long. So that obviously added to the runtime as well, yeah. Yep, I've noticed that too. Okay, we begin with the Minute Societies. Kiki and David rush in. They are like, can we get the story started? Get the story started. We want to get the story started. Why? Gororama, a triple feature monster movie marathon playing that night. And I was on board straight away. I was like, good kids. This is this is, this is is my jam. Yeah. <laughs> Especially as it's called Fright Night. It will not be your only vampire reference you're going to get in this. I'll tell you now. 
Uh, she and David had gotten through passes to go. Frank explained that he's been to fight that before and he's never gone back. Not because he's scared of the movies, but rather the fact that you sit in the movie theater for so long, you start to forget that the real world even exists. The only thing that seems real is the horror movie playing up on the screen. Um, okay, Frank. Um, I'm like, okay, calm down. But also initially, because bear in mind, I'm writing these notes where I don't know what's coming. I was like, oh, man, we just did an episode about blurring, blurring of fiction and reality. Don't do another one. Mm, at yeah. the time I, I love being wrong the best thing in the world is to be wrong in a, in in the sense that where something turns out better than you expected frank continues sometimes the movie seems so real that it's hard to tell the difference between what's make-believe and what's really there submitted for the approval of the midnight society this is the tale of the midnight madness so the realia Real, rialto I was, I was struggling to say it when it was playing the rialto is an old-fashioned movie theater showing black and white movies and unsurprisingly in this modern time of the 90s business is bad as they only seem to have one customer an elderly woman the possibility of having to close down weighs heavily on the mind of pete who's a teenage employee who basically loves the place and his co-worker katie does too but she needs a better job so has applied for one at the new multiplex cinema nearby so brilliant setup love the location actually feels like an old theater looks has a vibe you can smell the dust and dirt and the two characters introduced the, who they are and what they are and what their motivations are is very, very clear. I love the idea of it being out of time because of the multiplex cinema nearby, which will have multiple screens and all these flashy things and all these things. It, it's a really good setup. Yeah, perfectly said. After a quiet Friday night, the manager, Mr. Christoph, bemoans the lack of takings before the two teams start to clean up. Pete flat out refuses to believe the theatre will close but might also have other distractions as he asks Katie out for food. She refuses, as she is homework, but she is nice about it. This is the only thing I don't care for in this episode. This very small thread subplot of, like, Pete and Katie liking each other. I don't think it matters. Mm, yeah, that's true. Uh, we next see Pete as he does what he can to try and get more people into the theatre, handing out flyers and trying to get the place confirmed as a historical landmark. I did like that idea. It's like, well, if it's a historical landmark, here's the thing, right? Hey, I hate to break it to you, bro. It can still be closed down. It just can't be demolished. Can't be taken down and destroyed. And yeah. they have to pay for the upkeep. Exactly. One night as they prepare to open, someone outside makes a hearty attempt to get in. Going to investigate the door in a slowly building horror movie thrill where they slowly walk to the door. The doors spring open to reveal the arrival of Dr. Vink. Listen, you said it when uh, he first showed up in the early episodes of season one. Everything is better if he's in it. Yeah, exactly. When he turns up, you know it's going to be a good one. And it just seems yeah. to always deliver. So He is, as usual, extravagant self, taken in the theatre and remarking on how much he loves the place and how it is perfect. Pete and Kate sort of follow him, confused into the sort of auditorium, the screening area, where the noise brings Mr. Kristoff in. He is naturally quick to try and send Dr. Vink away. Dr. Vink tells Mr. Christoph that he's come to save the theatre and it won't even cost a dime. Dr. Vink explains that he used to be a filmmaker way back when classic black and white silent films were all the rage. He claims that his films were so popular and they always had a certain magic to them. And he then reveals a film canister from under his jacket as if by magic. Uh, this is a very talky section, but... The conversation and how it plays out is really compelling. Yeah, I, talking of Doctor Vink again, any scene he's in, he just automatically steals it, and uh, I thought there was a lot of fun back and forth dialogue here as well. Doctor Vink then explains that it's a horror movie he made many years ago, a vampire movie, but different because in it the vampire wins. Now, I, I stopped him. I remember I was trying to think at the time, have I seen, what vampire movies do I know where the vampire wins? And it's actually mm. quite difficult to come up with one. I mean, in Death Horror in, in general, it's obviously usually not as vampire movies, but in, in general, usually ends on a happier note, doesn't it? <clears throat> Does indeed. And Dr. Vic promises that if, if this film is shown in the theatre, then people will flock to see it. As said before, great performance by Iron Tagger as usual. Obviously, Mr. Kristoff isn't convinced, but Dr. Vink insists that they'd at least try. And I was kind of like, it's, it's, you know what I mean? All right, we'll do it. We'll do it this weekend and see what happens. Do you know what I mean? Like, just do it. 
Mm-hmm. All he wants in return, Dr. Vink, all he wants in return is one night a week to show more of his old movies. Mr. Christoph sort of laughs, agrees, shakes hand, and as he, Pete, and Katie turn away to catch the forming film canister, Dr. Vink basically disappears. Everybody takes that in their stride a little bit too much. I mean, it's so quick, he would have had to have vanished, or you'd be like, oh, he's hiding behind a curtain. Does that mean he's, <laughs> what's, you, know, you know? Yeah, that's true. Right? That is a good point. But interestingly, I didn't expect it to do this. The film canister is taken to the projection room and forgotten about, probably forgotten about, because I just presume it would roll straight into the next thing, but it isn't. It's just forgotten about. Mm, that's true. That's surprising. Hmm. He continues his campaign to save the theatre, but time is up as they're brought to Mr. Christoph's office and told that the place closes in two weeks. The owners have had enough. As Pete bemoans this news to Katie, unknown to them in the projection room, Dr. Vink's film canister opens with a glow and the nearby projector starts to overload smoke and short out, ruining the black and white Western that a handful of people were watching in the theatre. So nice little setup there for the next part. Arriving at the projector booth, Katie prepares to give out refunds, but Pete decides, no, let's put on Dr. Vink's movie instead. And Katie runs back down to the auditorium and tells the audience, look, we're going to put this film on. It's a new, new one we've never shown before, a classic silent black and white film. And even if you don't like it, like if you stay and watch it, and if you don't like it, we'll give you a refund uh, too. So pretty generous, generous offer overall. Mm hmm. There is a funny scene here because they have this regular old woman who sort of is one of her only regular clientels. And she comes around, and she's obviously there all the time, but she comes around saying, it better be good because my time is precious. It's like, but you're always there. Ha ha ha. <laughs> the film starts and it is called Nosferatu, the demon vampire. So yes, this is a take on the Nosferatu story, though obviously some significant changes here and there and so on. The actual vampire is called Nosferatu, not Count Orlok, for example. But obviously the, the original Nosferatu is in the public domain. So you can get away with quite a lot now. Yeah. The look of the vampire seems to have an effect on the, vamp on the audience. And afterwards, it does seem as though everybody loved it. So much so that no one has asked for a refund. And Pete and Katie are very happy, celebrating success and hugging. And Katie remarks that it is exactly what Dr. Vink said would happen. And we then see the film canister slightly open again and glow. It never really is explained the effect the film has on people. Do you have an, an, uh, an answer that you think you would work? Not really, no. It does seem like people are somewhat, they're hypnotised by it in some way, or just because obviously it's an old timey classic horror movie so considering when this is based you find, you find it a bit hard to believe that it's that shocking to people in terms of like the scares and horror that would be in it so it's it's kind of like it is kind of, they don't really give you a good explanation though no. i went with that as well i figured it would have had some hypnotic uh capabilities but then i wondered why what would be the purpose and uh unfortunately i don't think that's really explained well either and i've given my own guess that it's basically potentially based around um, life force and bringing life to the, the 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 characters in the movies, something like that. Something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Uh, we yeah. now jump briefly back to the Midnight Society. The last time we will do this happily, as we see Frank has everyone's attention, and I was like, you know what? For once, I'm not surprised. This is a good story. Mm, definitely. And we see the Nosferatu movie is a hit doing so well for business that the owners have decided to no longer sell the building. So apparently they've uh, pulled in enough money in a short amount of time that they're like, yeah, cr crack on. And they've started to show the movie weekly and it plays now to packed houses. And interesting, we do actually see little part of the movie. We see how it ends too, where the character of Harker, uh, yes, trying to pull Nosferatu's coffin into the sunlight to burn it. But Nosferatu intercepts him, biting him on the neck. And that's kind of how the movie ends with a vampire winning. Personally, I think it looked like a really crap ending, but mm. each to our own. Yeah. <laughs> As the patrons file out, Pete and Katie celebrate the take-ins and Pete sets about asking Katie out again. However, but the Vink is here for payment. He's arrived and he's happy to hear about the success, even though, as he said himself, predicted it. Uh, Mr. Cross Christoph obviously arrives and happily greets Dr. Vink, 
But as the pair talk, he starts to go back on a deal. I could not understand Dr. Uh, Mr. Christoph's like reason to go back on the deal here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He offers to pay Dr. Vink for the movie, but obviously that is not what Dr. Vink wants. Mr. Christoph refuses to allow Dr. Vink and Knight to play his movies. Um, what's call it, suggesting that because the theatre is now popular, they're getting more bigger name movies in. So if he gives up a night of the week for Dr. Vink, he would lose money. But that doesn't make any sense. Dr. Vink's Nosferatu movie would certainly suggest that other movies might also, you know, it doesn't quite make sense for him. I'm not too happy with it. No, I agree. It didn't really make much sense to me either. So frustrated, Dr. Vink then changes his tone, laughing and leaving with the words, this story is far from over. In fact, it's only just beginning. So obviously there's your threat. Sometime later, Pete wants to understand just why Dr. Vink's movie is so magical for an audience, but ends up briefly drifting off while watching it. So I thought that was a cool character thing as well. He's like, look, I'm going to watch this really and try and understand what it is that's so magical about it. But I guess it maybe doesn't have the same effect on Pete. Yeah, another unexplained aspect of the story. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, while we're talking it through, there's a few things actually that aren't explained well. On screen, we see Nosferatu turn to stare at him from inside and then walk towards the screen, walking through it and becoming colour. We criticise poor effects in Are mm. You Afraid of the Dark? I couldn't believe how good this was, how well this was done. Generally brilliant. Completely agree. Yeah, there's a moment coming up sooner or later when they go into the movie itself. That's also a really impressive effect. It is, it is. And as a horror movie fan, so a little bit why this particular scene has a, a bigger effect on me. Um, there are movies out there that have had long term effects on me because I saw them too young and they scared me shitless as a kid. I love them for it now as an adult. And two of those movies are both from the same franchise. It's Demons and Demons two uh, Lumberto Barva's um, movies uh, the first one of course set in a multiplex a cinema and the second one involves a high rise block of flats where the demon comes through the TV I just the vibes from this man just were really strong yeah yeah definitely uh, where are we up to right so Pete now wakes up and I guess in his half asleep state he saw what happened but he thought it was a dream naturally, Mm. and goes to talk to Katie. And as they talk, they're sharing a bit of a moment and just about to kiss when they hear Mr. Kristoff scream. Run into his office, they find him passed out on his desk with two bite marks and a little bit of blood. Ooh, blood. And I'm afraid of the dark. I know! (laughs) Uh, Two bite marks on his neck. Pete tries to call for an ambulance, but the phone line is dead. And as they try to find a way out, they run into the vampire Nosferatu, who, credit to the actor, is doing a fairly solid version of what you would expect from that vampire. Mm, yeah, and the, I thought the makeup effect for him was pretty decent as well. So, Agreed. They run for their lives, barricade themselves in a room as Pete realises the vampire came from the movie and this is Dr. Vink's revenge. He has an idea and tells Katie, get the movie going, but just the last part of it. As Nosferatu advances on him, Katie shouting from above gets the vampire's attention and he goes for her instead for some reason. I hated this particular scene. It's just he's there over Pete and Katie, who's all the way up there, screams and the vampire goes, scurries off. They're like, kill yeah, him and her. Literally wrote themselves into a corner and <laughs> didn't know how to get out of it. Yeah, exactly that. As the vampire closes in on her, she manages to start the movie. And this seems to compel Nosferatu to return to it as we see Pete enter the black and white world, which I think, I presume, is the the effect you were talking about. That's right, yeah. Inside the movie, Pete tries to finish what Harker started, but Nosferatu arrives to stop him from moving the coffin. However, Pete knows horror and actually takes a leaf out of a certain classic vampire movie, Instead, pulls the curtain down, bringing sunlight in and destroying the vampire. Uh, take that from whichever one you want. You can take it from the classic Dracula with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. And that ending scene there. Or hell, go a bit more modern and a bit more insane and take it from Fright Night. Mm, for sure. Pete is able to step back through the screen and reunite with Katie. Mr. Christoph arrives disorientated, but seemingly okay and unaware of the events. Before they can go any further, though, Dr. Vink is sitting in the auditorium shouting, bravo, bravo. 
And Mr. Christoph tells Dr. Vuk, look, I've reconsidered and I'm sorry, and I'll give you your one night. However, Dr. Vink reveals that it's not necessary anymore as he has bought the theater outright, showing them the deed. And now he can show his movies every night and he has movies far better than this one. Great ending, fun. Yeah. Very sneaky. <laughs> I like it, just buy it out from underneath him. Mm. With the story over, Frank asks who now is going to the Fright Night Marathon and Kiki and David bottle it, giving Frank their tickets. But in an interesting twist, he's happy to receive them. After all, it's just a movie and him and Gary head off to enjoy the show, implying that Frank may have just scammed the tickets out of them to scare them so he <laughs> could get the tickets and him and Gary could go together. And I was like, ooh. And I was like, you know what, actually, that kind of ties into Frank's sort of... Because when he was first introduced, he was a little bit more on the other side of the tracks character, like quite different to the likes of Kristen and things like yeah. that. And I was like, I like that, I like that. Um, mm -hmm. Good little ending for the Midnight Society. And overall, just an absolute brilliant, brilliant episode. Um, whatever faults we talked through, things that I'd explain are made up by just great visuals, great storytelling overall as consistent beginning, middle and end. Interesting and likable characters. Scares, I think, could actually scare someone younger. Certain imagery mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And a great ending. Oh, I've got very few complaints. Yeah, there's not much to criticise. Um it's like we were saying at the beginning about what these shows are capable of doing, and every now and then it demonstrates that it's possible to make these short stories that come under 25 minutes, but they don't feel like wasted potential for once. You know, you know, mm -hmm. I thought it'd have been really cool if we got to see more of Doctor Fink's stories. You always, but that's what's great about this episode is it leaves you wanting more. You want to see, you actually want it. You, some of the episodes we see and we're like, we don't want to see that continue. What happens next? Who cares? But this is one of those ones where I think you really want to. Yeah, and I think it's got everything you could really hope for in this for this uh, type of show. Yeah, I think it's, as you said at the beginning, probably the best episode so far, in my opinion. I don't think so, probably. I think it is. Um, the fact that I, 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 I always think of tale, the tale of laughing in the dark as one of the strongest episodes, I think I like this better because mm -hmm. I just love the location. I love that theatre. Yeah, and it also has that nostalgia feel of like an, the old theatres, the independent cinemas that kind of got put out of business by the chain franchise cinemas that we have today. It kind of makes you feel a little bit nostalgic for that kind of thing. And like the, the time period where you, people could just go to the movie theatres, it was like a cheap experience. You could go to at any point, you know, it was affordable for everyone to go yeah. every single night. Like the, the, the old lady, she'd go, she'd go in there every night to watch a new movie and that kind of thing. And yeah, seeing like these more obscure films and rather than like mainstream ones and that. So yeah, I think it just like ticks a lot of boxes. Agreed. It is uh, easily, when it comes to the tier list for this season, going to be uh, right up the very top. And it will be an interesting battle when it comes to the 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 overall finale tier list that we do with the top episode to see where it ranks up. Because, of course, we've got plenty more seasons to go and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully more good episodes to come. But right now, this is the tale of the Midnight Madness, episode two of season two from Are You Afraid of the Dark? What do you reckon? Do you rate it as highly as we do? Let us know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to see more content like this, please consider hitting the subscribe button. It is gratefully appreciated. You can find us over at gbhbl.com, our full website where reviews, news, and so much more goes up daily. We're also on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, threads, at GBHBL. Just search for GBHBL and you will find us out there. We also have merchandise on sale. You can access the shop via the website.